this is not the petro yuan. This is not the petro ruble. Mm-hmm. This is not a gold backed yuan. This is not a gold standard. This is not the end of the US dollar. It's not the end of the euro. It's not the end of the world. It's not any of those things. But that's what everyone's running around on websites or whatever shouting about. It's none of those things. In fact, quite the opposite. And this is where the Russian mentality comes in. The BRICS want the dollar to be around. They want the dollar gold market to exist because they get to free ride. The dollar has to do all the dirty work in the gold space and BRICS get the free ride by declaring one brick equal to a weight of gold. Again, weight's the key. The BRICS summit in Johannesburg two weeks ago was attended by leaders and representatives from more than 60 countries. Six were officially invited to join the bloc. Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. They are set to join the founding members, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And while these countries are vulnerable due to their dependence on the dollar, there is no other game in town. The dollar still dominates global trade and 90% of foreign exchange transactions. Jim Rickards, the author of the national bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis, clarifies some misconceptions about the role of the BRICS in the global financial system. The BRICS, rather than seeking the downfall of the US dollar, want the dollar to remain strong and for the gold market to thrive. This is because they benefit from the dollar's status as the primary reserve currency, which performs the heavy lifting in the gold market. While the dollar's share of the global currency landscape has declined over the past two decades from 66% to 58%, its primary reserve status has not wavered. Rickards emphasizes that the BRICS are free riding on the existing dollar-based gold system. They don't have to buy or own vast quantities of gold, and their currency isn't redeemable for gold. Instead, they base their currency's value on gold's weight and allow the dollar gold market to go wherever it goes. This strategy enables the BRICS to enjoy the benefits of a gold-backed currency without taking on the complexities and costs of maintaining such a system. We will now bring you clips from Jim Rickard's interview with Wealthian. But before we do, if you want more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thank you and enjoy the video. The value of the brick is not determined with reference to any other currency. It's determined with reference to gold by weight of gold. Now, I don't know the weight, they'll pick one, but again, it doesn't matter because the right. it's not even math, it's math, it's logic. And by the way, now um, we're back to Aristotle's transit of law. And this is the key. This is this unlocks the whole thing because um, Aristotle said, you know, if A equals B equals C, then A equals C. The B can drop out. It's not even uh, arithmetic. It's uh, it's logic. Uh, it's right. It's, called the transit of life. I'm, I'm certain that Aristotle invented it. If any Greek scholars know an earlier source, let me know. Um, so what, what the BRICS have done is they have dodged the biggest bullet, the thing that caused Bretton Woods ultimately to fail, the thing that potentially stands in the way of all this. They've defined their currency by weight of gold. Now, uh, a weight of gold has a dollar value, right? So. A equals B equals C. One brick equals one, could be an ounce or a kilo, it doesn't matter. Call it an ounce. One brick equals one ounce of gold equals today, 1970. Okay? Mm-hmm. Well, through the transit of law, drop out the B and one brick equals 1970, $1,970. But that's constant. I mean, that logic works for a moment in time, but it's not fixed because the price of gold is going to fluctuate daily or minute, minute by minute, right? So what's going to happen is the dollar gold, call it exchange rate, the dollar price of gold. So the LBMA, the COMEX, the the London Metals Exchange, um, you know, JP Morgan, unallocated forward contracts, the whole huge gold market in dollars is still going to exist. The BRICS want the dollar to be around. They want the dollar gold market to exist because they get to free ride. The dollar has to do all the dirty work in the gold space and bricks get to free ride by declaring one brick equal to a weight of gold. Again, weight's the key. They just let the dollar gold market go wherever it goes and the brick is worth an ounce or whatever, kilo, whatever. And uh, yeah, the dollar equivalent under the transit of law changes, but they're not pegged to the dollar. They're not fighting that fight. So this, uh, I analogize this, it's like you're in your house 
in the backyard, you know, your landscaper is like digging trenches and putting in plants and sweating and doing all this work. And you're sitting there with a glass of iced tea enjoying the view. In other words, the bricks get to free ride on the dollar gold system. And they don't, they want that system. They don't want it to go away because they get the benefit of a gold value. Now think of what the bricks don't have to do in this scenario. They don't have to buy gold. They don't even have to own gold. They do, but they no one, no one in the world has enough gold to back a currency. This currency, the brick, will not be redeemable into gold. Now, maybe there's a dealer somewhere who will take it. That's that's between you and, and the dealer. But it's not like you're going to be able to march down to the People's Bank of China with a pile of bricks and say, give me the gold. They're not going to do it. So it's not redeemable. Um, they're not going to make a market. Uh, they're not going to maintain a value because they don't have to because it's by weight. They just get to sit back and piggyback on the dollar gold system and let do the dollar do all the dirty work. Rickards emphasizes the role of the Federal Reserve as the ultimate buyer of treasuries, with an intermediate buyer being the U.S. banking system, which has evolved from the 1950s when large banks had a substantial portion of their balance sheets in treasuries. The U.S. government influences these banks and is likely to buy bonds. This intermediate buyer pool could offer a cushion before the Fed expands its balance sheet, especially during a reset, when buying perceived safe treasuries becomes more attractive than making loans. Furthermore, he mentions the Chinese strategy, where commercial banks in China are selling dollars to support the UN. China's major state-owned banks were seen busy selling U.S. dollars to buy UN in both onshore and offshore spot foreign exchange markets this week. People with direct knowledge of the matter said, in an attempt to slow the UN's depreciation, the UN has lost about 2.4% against the dollar since this month and 6% since the start of the year. The onshore UN traded at 7.3145 per dollar as of 0,442 GMT, while the offshore UN last fetched 7.3400. Rickard sees that this approach allows the Chinese government to manage its currency strength without excessive reliance on foreign exchange markets. Let's get back to the interview. The first one is, is the Fed the ultimate buyer of last resort of treasuries? Yes. Um, but there's an intermediate buyer, which is the U.S. banking system. In the 1950s, uh, a typical large U.S. bank balance sheet was 40% treasuries. That was normal. That wasn't like hoarding. Uh, today, it's about 5 to 7%. So I think you'll get a phone call to Jamie Dimon and yeah. uh, get the, all the other CEOs, uh, Jane Meyer and the lady of city. Um, they'll call them first to say, you, people got to buy bonds. And of course, they're all under the thumb of the U.S. government and they will. So you might have a pretty good cushion of bond buyers before you have to turn to the Fed and expand the Fed balance sheet. Now, that doesn't especially if it's a recession, because they're not going to want to make loans with that money. They'd rather buy treasuries that are perceived to be safe. Probably. Correct, especially with positive positive carry and lever, lever 10 to 1 under Basel, you can make uh, very good returns on equity. So, um, so you do have a large pool of intermediate buyers before you get to the Fed. It doesn't really solve the problem. It just passes it around the banking system. By the way, the Chinese are doing something very similar right now. Everyone's like, well, why hasn't the... Um, uh, People's Bank of China sold more dollars. Well, it's because they're making the banks do it. The commercial banks are, are selling the dollars and propping up the yuan. Uh, and we can see something similar in the United States. So that's one. I, I just kind of pencil in the commercial banking system, at least the big banks, as a potential buyers of not quite last resort um, as a way to put it. But the other the other thing, um, the, the BRICS, what they've done, this is part of the brilliance, they've opted out of the exchange market. They're like, because you know, normally if the dollar is right. getting weaker, you're getting stronger. Um, that's bad for exports. It's bad for export right. jobs, et cetera. You know, and this currency wars. That was my first book, Currency Wars. But they've, by defining their currency by weight of gold, not not dollar amount, but by weight of gold, they're out of the foreign exchange market. Yeah, so and they can they, they can just sit back and watch the show. We haven't learned about uncertainty because we already know about uncertainty. We all understand that we're living in an uncertain world and we have to make allowance for that. So we didn't learn that, we already knew that. I said, well, what is new is the tempo of shocks is accelerating. Mm -hmm. um, there are shocks, go back to the panic of 1837 or 1857 or 1898, you know, you know, all of them. Uh, I've lived through another enough of them. I'm kind of a magnet for trouble, but there's no end to financial panics. Um, but uh, what's uh, what, what what's different about this is that uh, we may be uh, 
looking at a, a, a tempo that's a lot faster. It's not every seven years or every 10 years anymore. Between uh, the U.S. is using, losing the war in Ukraine badly. Uh, you might even see Poland come in and bite off the western half of uh, Ukraine, with former Ukraine, up to Lviv. Um, and Russia take the bottom one third, including the entire coastline through Odessa and leave a little rump state, landlocked rump state around Kiev, maybe. Um, so uh, and there's no way there's no way to cover this stuff up. The, the New York Times and the uh, Washington Post, I read them the same way I read Pravda during the Cold War. It's all lies. <laughs> But they're valuable lies because it's good to know what the other guy's lying. Exactly. Yeah. He's lying. He's like, you must be. You must have a reason for that. It must be important to you. So there's intelligence value in yeah. lies, and that's why I read the Times and the Post. Looking ahead, it's likely that the BRICS will continue to pursue their unique approach to the global financial system. Contrary to some expectations, they won't be pushing for the downfall of the U.S. dollar. Instead, they will prefer a strong dollar. What are your thoughts on the BRICS approach to the global financial system? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below. If you found this video informative, remember to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and enable notifications to stay informed about our latest videos on silver, gold, and copper. Thank you for watching, and we appreciate your support.